In today's video, we are talking about Meteor Radiance. And we are not only talking about Meteor Radiance, we will also do some Python coding to get an understanding of the Radiance. But before we dive into the code, let's try to understand what the Radiance are. Consider, for example, a train. Yeah, You see a train in the horizon, it's becoming bigger and bigger and bigger, and then it stops at the train station or so. Of course, the train is on the tracks and the tracks go back into the horizon and at the point where it's getting very small, it's something like the vanishing point. Yeah, vanishing point you may know from your daily experience when you're on, on the on the on the highway or so with your car and it's a very long straight road. The road is going to some point uh, at the horizon. Yeah, or you maybe know it when you draw things or something like that. And this vanishing point um, for our tracks is in meteor signs, the radiant. Yeah? So consider the Earth with its atmosphere and then a meteoroid flying to the Earth. At 100 kilometers, it is starting to evaporate, it's illuminating, it's doing its science stuff and then it vanishes. And this streak you see from the surface, the meteor, has also some kind of vanishing point. And this vanishing point is called the radiant. Now we have hundred thousands of data in our database we downloaded last time. Um, if you didn't download it yet, then uh, do it. The code is of course on GitHub as well as the code we will talk today. And these radiant information, they give some pretty nice insights and we will get a good understanding what, for example, a meteor shower is, especially the proceeds. So I would suggest this is enough for now and let's dive into the code. Now we have here our Python code. Of course, the code from last time, the data underscore download is something you could um, or should have executed already. It is the script that generates or downloads all the data. I just executed all the scripts here to get the data and the data are then stored in our folder. And now our second um, Jupyter notebook is here called meteor underscore radiance. And this thing is well, pretty simple. Uh, first of all, we load all our data. We have, as a small reminder, two CSV files. One I call Meteor Complete and the other one is the Meteor Error CSV. Um, the Meteor Complete contains all relevant information. We have uh, the year of the meteor appearance, the month, the day, and also the fraction of the day, the apparent magnitude, the right ascension declination. These are the sky coordinates. We will talk about it in a minute. And then we have also something we will use today, the so-called geocentric velocity. So the velocity, the entry velocity of the meteor at the point of its measurement. So what was the velocity of the meteor when it entered the atmosphere? And then, of course, we have here the different orbital elements, like, for example, the perihelion given in astronomical unions, the eccentricity and all the other things. The error um, CSV file um, contains basically the same data, but pi is not given. Pi is the um, uh, argument of perihelion. So this is not in our database, unfortunately. Good. Um, we can directly extract some of our data. We want to get an understanding of the radiance. So we will talk about sky maps. And for this, we will use or extract the right ascension and the declination. And before um, we take a look at this, let's go to our open source planetarium software Stellarium. It's open source, so download it. It's pretty amazing. I did some previous videos about it. I always use it as a small reference and also to help a little bit understanding the data. Now let's go here to Stellarium. And this is something, um, yeah, this is how the software looks like here. Uh, and this blue grid you see is the um, coordinate system of the sky, this um, so-called equatorial coordinate system. Also, I did some previous videos about this. Now, this is, of course, um, here, this is the ground. It's a little bit, and it's a little bit, it's completely dependent where you are on Earth. And also the grid depends on the time. So this is August um, from last year. And we will also, no, August this year. And we will also talk about a little bit later why I chose August. Now, if we, for example, take a star, like here you have Vega, yeah, we click on it. And then we have here the right ascension and declination coordinates. Yeah, we have two values, the um, right ascension declination on date and J2000. And um, the difference is um, just a very minor difference. We see here only a few arc seconds or arc minute maximum. The thing is that the coordinate system, although it's static, it's not, let's say, always static because the Earth is yeah, also a little bit moving a little bit and the stars are moving also. 
very, very slowly, but it's measurable. So we have always um, the coordinates with respect to the year 2000 and also the coordinates with respect to now. Good, this is basically all the things to know about the sky coordinates for now. Again, I did some previous videos on this one, but let's move back to the code. We also extract our geocentric velocity and the three yeah, pair of columns that we need for, for computing the date time. Let's take a look um, at our meteor data. First of all, I would like to filter the meteor data because you can do some astrodynamical analysis and so on that will give you the uh, insight that the geocentric velocity of meteors has to be around 11 and 72.8 or so kilometers per second. It has some dynamical reasons. Yeah, I don't want to dive too much into this now. Of course, the measurements have always an error, so you should theoretically consider this a little bit, but I just made a strong filter on this one. And with this filter, we reduce our data set that consists of 895,000 meteors to 864,000. So we remove 30,000 meteors round about, which is, which is okay, I would say. Now let's make a sky map. And the sky map is, difficult here because we have 800,000 dots. Now, if you want to work with so many data points, I will give at the end of the video, I will show you a library where you can create, let's say, more sophisticated plots with these kind of huge data sets. But here we use simply matplotlib. And this is what the next part does. First of all, we check if our right ascension and declination values make sense. Yeah, we have between the zero and six, 360 degrees, the right ascension. And the declination yeah, from the no south to the North Pole, we have minus 90 to plus 90 degrees. So yeah, basically the entire sky coordinate system um, is uh, covered with all the data. Not surprising with almost a million data points. And then we need to convert the uh, values, the right ascension and the declination from degrees to radians because this is what matplotlib requires. And then we need also to convert the right ascension values because matplotlib does not uh, expect values from zero to 360 degrees, but from minus 180 to plus 180. This script is also something I recall all the time over and over again. In one of my previous videos, I explained it. Um, if you are really into this, in, then check out what the lambda function does. This may be a small homework for you. Now let's create a plot. And the plot is, of course, as I said, with matplotlib, we make a use a projection, the so-called Eithoff projection. Yeah, we have a sphere. We need to map it somehow on a two-dimensional plane. And there are different projections like the Eithoff, Hammer or Hammer Eithoff. We have the mole-wide um, projection. We have also cylindrical projection and something more and more than that. So um, choose one that you like. I choose the Mitov projection. And the projection differences are that the one is um, uh, considers all the angles equally, all the, the areas and so on, but you can never have um, a realistic representation of the angles and the, sur and the area and so on. So every projection had a, had a, has its advantages and disadvantages. We create a scatter plot. Every dot has an alpha value of 0.01, yeah, because again, 800,000 dots, it would be quite crowded, let's say. So let's take it, like the, let's take, let's say only 1%. And then we have to replace our ticks. Um, the ticks are the values we have um, um, on the x-axis, yeah, from, um, from, 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 Zero, zero hours to 24 hours yeah like in like you saw it in stellarium we have to replace the values and then simply create this funny plot cool what do we see here um we see a lot of radiant uh, dots and a lot of radiant plots it seems that it's a little bit also more focused on the northern part um this is because the data we obtain are mostly from the northern hemisphere so we have way more data here than in the south and we see certain let's say areas of concentration and these areas of concentration these radiant clusters these are the meteor uh, showers so if you know oh, we have the quadrantids coming or the perseids yeah maybe i think most of you have heard about the perseids um, in august one of these clusters is the perseids 
and some have longer streaks. We will talk about this next time, why there are certain streaks, yeah, as this somehow scattered or so. And, um, but for now, we let's talk about more about the big blobs we have here. So before we check where the proceeds are, I would suggest we add another information. We use the geocentric velocity and add it as a color information into this plot. We do this at the same time as last time. We simply create um, a plot again, a scatter plot, and this time the color is corresponding to the velocity, the geocentric velocity, and we use a C map. And then the C map is, um, yeah, is here this one here, the jet C map. I like it because it has a lot of colors, fancy. And then we can do a same plot again. And then we see here all the different sources with the entry velocity. And you see some are coming with a very small velocity, like around, I don't know, like 15, 18, 20 kilometers per second. We have here this blob here, which is like around 35 kilometers per second. And then we have this huge orange blob here, and this one is around 60 kilometers a second or 50 or something like that. And I would suggest let's have a look at this particular blob. Um, or let's say now I spoiled it a little bit because now we apply a filter and that filters for a certain date time. Now we have three columns, as I said, the year, the month, and the fraction of the day. So we first create a Python daytime object, and then we use the daytime to create the filtering. This is what we do here. We have the daytime column that is simply uh, yeah, created by calling the daytime function with the year, month, and day. For the day, we use the floor function because we have still this fractional part. And um, for now, we can, we can just ignore it. Uh, we will use it next time, though. And then we have here the different, um, the different, oh no, we are not ignoring it. Ha, huh, I just lied. I'm sorry about that. I just edited it as I, as I recall. We have here the date time. We call the date time and then we add with the de time delta function, the fraction of the day. And how do we do, we do this? We use simply the modulo function. So if we have here, like for example, 1.5 days, we say 1.5 modulo one uh, results to 0.5 because you are, let's say, extracting the ones all the time and the remaining part is 0.5. And 0.5 is put into this time delta, which means it's then 12 hours. So sorry about lying around. We are doing this here as well. And then we can take a look at our final data frame. We have here the right ascension declination again, but most importantly, the ones for our um, for our plot. And then also the daytime part with the, not only with the date, but also with the fraction that is now given in hours, minutes, and seconds, and also milliseconds, but it's a little bit maybe an overkill, I don't know. So let's take all this information and filter out the part when the proceeds are coming. And of course, we don't have to do our own biggest research now. From historical data and scientific observations, we know when the proceeds are, they are mostly beginning mid of August. Well, at least the peak is there. So we filter the, um, the date, the, the range for the month eight for the August and the day between the 5th and the 19th of August and well the peak is at, at around the uh, 12th so I took the peak time plus minus seven days that's basically it and then we have this new data frame called Perseids peak where we have around 75,000 meteors of course not all the meteors as are associated with the Perseids but the probability is very high that we have a lot of Perseids there and we can only find out if we take a look at the radiance. Now let's plot this particular data in our scatter plot, considering the geocentric velocity again. And Evola, we have here this big blob and also here two or three strange other things, but we will talk about it in a second. Here we have the proceeds. So this is how we can now, or also you can, for example, filter by different uh, times and so on to get an understanding where where we have certain uh, radians, where we have certain um, um, certain meteor showers, so that you can also compare also with Stellarium, because Stellarium is pretty nice. Stellarium allows one also to see where the Perseids are. 
And let's take a look first here at our um, plot. So it's not very high precise the, with this huge blob, which is at around three hours right ascension. And the declination is at around, I don't know, let's say 55, between 55 and 60 degrees. So let's take a look at Stellarium. Stellarium knows the Perseids. So this is also why I um, chose the um, August, the 11th of August now. And we have here the Perseids. So let's go there and screw zoom a little bit. And we see that we have here at around three hours, which fits with our computations before. And now that's a little bit difficult, but we see here these two lines are 60 and, six, no, 60 and 55 degrees in declination. So we potentially found the proceed, which is pretty nice. And we have also the other smaller blobs there. And we see also here some other, um, some other, uh, um, what, uh, showers, the Northern Aquarides and the Southern Delta Aquarides, the Antihelion, whatever this is. I mean, we will talk about it in a future video because this is a very special, um, special, uh, case and also some Alpha Capricornids. Yeah. So, I don't know, let's see, we have 23 hours and at around zero and uh, minus 15. So let's move back. We have here, what did I just say? I totally forgot already. Uh, 23 hours, yeah, fit per fits perfectly, zero degrees and minus 15. So yeah, it's potentially we have here the southern and the northern accurates. Yeah, we have of course to verify this with the velocity and so on. And here this blue dot here at around 21 or something could be the Alpha Cap Capricornids. So let's have a look here. Um, for example, every information here is also given with the geocentric velocity. The left-hand side, a lot of information I know, but here we see the geocentric meteoric velocity, 23 kilometers per second. So the color should be something like a bluish color and you see very tiny, it's bluish. So could be could be that we found the Capricorn needs in this plot. Now, what is the goal of our project? First of all, we want to understand all the meteors, we understand the radiance and so on. And now in the next videos, we will take a look at the time distribution of the meteor. So how does it behave over time? And what is this particular anti-helion source? Yeah, we have here a third, a third source, the fourth source. I don't see it really. Is it there or not? Yeah, um, we have to talk about it in our, one of our future videos. Now, in the very long run, yeah, I mean, I also would like to somehow at some point conclude meteor science. Of course, we will take a look at the orbital data. We will take a look at um, at at all the all the data and information we have to uh, from an astronomical perspective. But at the, the, the final goal of our project is we want we will create a machine learning algorithm that identifies or clusters meteor showers by itself. So stay tuned for the next video. Thanks for listening and see you next time. Oh, before I forget, I just wanted to make note the video and I meant I, I recognized that I totally forgot to mention something I promised you in the beginning of the video, talking about a tool that allows you to plot millions of data points quite quickly and nicely and in a modern way. And this tool is also a Python library. It is open source and it's called Data Shader, or as they state, they accurately render even the largest data. And instead of showing you some code or something like that, I mean, I just recommend you the uh, user guide uh, tutorials and so on. Let's have a look, for example, at this plot here from the United States that is based on 300 million points and it's being rendered within a fraction of a second because um, not like matplotlib, data shader does not render each dot individually. It is more like uh, trying to aggregate important information in the background before plotting it. So for example, if you have a 4K display, then you can adjust it in a way that each pixel is like um, like a two-dimensional heat map pixel where the, uh, the, 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 the brightness of the pixel is then corresponds to the value of this particular uh, histogram bin. So all the aggregation functionalities and so on are being, is being done on a data frame level. 
and the plotting afterwards is way quicker than plotting all the points into the plot. And with that way, you can then filter data frames, aggregate them, so everything is really done on the CPU level uh, quite quickly. And the rendering afterwards is based on some high level aggregated data. So data shader, something you want to, or you can try to play around with. I wanted to use it also for the sky maps, but unfortunately there is no functionality for sky coordinates. I tried to hack a little bit around this geographic coordinate system, but it didn't work. So if you have some free time and you would like to enthusiastically add data shader with some astronomy functionalities, feel free to do so.